Okay, so we are going to wrap up our presentation today. On Monday, you will have an, obviously I get a phone call. On Monday, you're going to have an open book written quiz. On Tuesday, you're going to have a regular quiz. Oh, we need notes for this. Good, how are you? Why you Is that one That was fashion. That was me. Uh, some of you, grade 12, some of you, this thing's recording by the way. I don't know why he's pointing. Okay, grade 12. Uh, some of you will be pulled out for um, ELL testing. I believe you're second. She's going first. Okay, we're going to continue. So as I was saying, you have a chapter six, seven, eight quiz. It's written, but it's open book on Monday. On the Tuesday, you'll have a multiple choice quiz. It's like 15 questions. I'll post something today. Okay, and that'll wrap up the next couple chapters. Okay. We're just going to look at some terminology here and a couple more events in the Cold War. Deterrence. Hey, Mr. Kawaja, do we need notes? Yeah, man, it's open book. Like, and bring your notes. And, and a part of the yellow yellow testing. You got no, 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 you don't you don't need any. Okay. So deterrence is a method of cold war rather than a method of hot war. It involves the building up of one's capacity to fight such that neither opponent will fight because of the expected outcomes. So deterrence is basically like if you understand the word to deter someone from doing something, basically like you know having a weapon and saying okay like if you break this power past this boundary of mind we're going to use this weapon so they're deterring each other from conflict okay so and obviously the nuclear weapons were a deterrent for the soviet union to continue the war mad mutually assured destruction this refers to essentially the use of nuclear weapons to the point where everything is destroyed i want to say there's a quote from john f kennedy who was president of america in the 60s and whatnot at the, we're gonna talk about the Cuban Missile Crisis in a moment. I believe he was quoted to have said that, he threatened the Soviets, he said that we have enough nuclear weapons to destroy the Earth five times over. And I remember my social studies teacher saying, well, you only need to do it once, All right? So both these, uh, both these uh, ideological sides have plenty of nuclear weapons <clears throat> that they can use on one another, but can also destroy the whole planet with, potentially. Okay, and that's mutually assured destruction using weapons of mass destruction. Cuban Missile Crisis, so just to go over that briefly, the Cubans, so Cuba is an island not that far off the coast of America. It was initially friendly to the Americans, but for a variety of reasons, they switched sides, they became communists. There, well, there was a communist revolution there. Once they did that, they agreed to allowing, you know, the Russians potentially to have weapons and think nukes I don't know if they got nukes there but they had weapons there was an agreement between Russia and Cuba which you know obviously so if we're looking at the map like obviously the big purple thing here is America Cuba is right there right so that would mean that all of their weapons can easily reach any of the major cities they can reach the capital of America which puts America under a lot of tension and threat and that was the Cuban Missile Crisis this was likely the closest both these powers came to full-on nuclear war. Um, they're pretty much ready to just blow each other up. Um, so here we see, you know, John F. Kennedy on the right side, and then I forget this guy's first name, but Khrushchev on the other side, and Dr. Cuba. Evil. What? Doctor Evil. Um, anyways, uh, some stuff I already mentioned. So there are Soviet missiles in Cuba. They can destroy many of the major cities in America. John F. Kennedy, the Americans, they don't like this. They set up a little blockade. Anyone ever seen the movie X Men: Days of Future Past? No. Want kids, right? So there's the that movie takes place at the same time, and obviously they use the mutants as their own thing. But you know, you have essentially a lineup of military and navy warships, and there's a particular line in the ocean, and 
the Americans said, if one of your Soviet ships crosses this line, like we're sending all the nukes. Like we're full on war, this is a declaration of war. Um, and you know, obviously no one really wants to destroy each other or the entire planet because then you know we're all dead and that would be terrible. They decided to compromise. Kennedy would remove nuclear weapons from Italy and Turkey and Khrushchev would remove missiles from Cuba. So this is brinkmanship, pushing a dangerous conflict to the tipping point, to the brink of war, right? So they continuously build one another up until the tensions are highest, and you know, fortunately they pulled back, otherwise maybe we wouldn't be here right now. Okay. This, this all took place in kind of the 60s. Um, a bit of Canada in the Cold War as well. <coughs> so as you're seeing, there are all these missile silos. There used to be missile silos all over Canada as you know just potential defense or offense as well in 1949 Canada becomes a founding member of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization NATO so it's a military alliance designed to defend member countries against attacks from the Soviet Union and its allies NATO is still functioning to this day and some people hypothesize or say that you know part of Russia's concern in this conflict with Ukraine is that while well, NATO keeps it getting closer and closer to them. And yeah, so sure. you might think that, well, you wouldn't want someone you really don't like sitting right next to you, right? We don't maybe witness that at the start of this class. Hey, <laughs> Look uh, at you right now. Hey, sir, two things. You think uh, Ukraine should, should join NATO? You should join NATO. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I, uh, and also, uh, sir, can I, uh, can I, can I go, go, go to my, my locker and uh, get, get the calls? Yes. Okay. Uh, you can't go through there. You have to go around. Okay, I'm, I'm blocking the camera. Don't worry. The camera is pointing this way. I, I, I don't understand. He was dancing on this side, and then he's ducking on that side. We're gonna open this up on camera. Oh, is, no. is it is it something horrible and rude? <laughs> what is this? Alert! Birthday detected. <laughs> Whose birthday is it? It's not my birthday. What is this? Grandson, your level of awesome just can't be contained. Unleash the fun and have a happy birthday. I'm so confused. My birthday isn't for like six months. No, no, it's April. Look at him. You think he's so funny, bro? We found this on the ground. We 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 got it signed. This is funny. Thank you. I'm gonna keep this. Look, it's all on camera too. Thank you so much. I just, I'm, I'm surprised. I didn't even notice you. Wait, did you. Did you read the envelope though? Read the envelope? <laughs> to Kawaja from our class, FYI, you are fired. Excellent. I'm taking my camera. I'm going. What are you trash talking me for? Not you, bud. Ooh. Oh, he never buys me anything. No, the white girls make him buy shit for them. Oh, <laughs> poor guy. Sorry, he said the people back at me. Oh, yeah, did you see it? Hey, his people. <laughs> I didn't need it. Okay, um, hopefully, grade 12s, let's, let's bring it back. All that little fun. Uh, also, it's a little dinosaur card. I'll show you guys. Look at that. No, it's a Velociraptor. It's uh, like a T Rex, but small. Um, I wish there was money in there. That would have been great. Uh, hopefully, you know what an alliance is. It's an agreement between a group of people. Alliances is you know a big primary cause of why World War One got out of hand. Um, you know, they provide a lot of security. You know, it's always good to have your boys ready on uh, standby if you ever get, get into a fight. Maybe you guys know that. <laughs> you always gotta have people ready. Uh, a little bit more about NATO. So all these blue countries, again, you can see in Russia is just over here. What's that? Yeah, that's Italy. 
Nadia. So you can imagine that Russia feels a little cornered in, again, with what we were saying about the about the conflict. Uh, we already chatted about the Warsaw Pact. We'll go over that some more. Uh, I guess these are all the countries. You can see them by name. These are, these are the countries for the Warsaw Pact. So again, you have the Warsaw Pact and NATO essentially going head to head there, um, maintaining their border and their boundary. Space race is kind of fascinating. So as I mentioned in one of the previous lectures, the, the Cold War was played out on many different fronts. They didn't just fight one another. They didn't directly fight one another. That's why it's called a Cold War. They had a lot of proxy wars. We'll have a lecture on the invasion of Afghanistan uh, later, maybe sometime next week. But it also took place in various sporting events and various culture events. One of them was the space race. So for whatever reason, you know, everybody wanted to get to space. I would assume part of it was just sending bombs through space is a lot easier because there's less atmospheric um, resistance on missiles as you, as you uh, go into outer space, there's no resistance. Uh, Okay. Anyways, for whatever reason, they get onto this little uh, conflict of like who's going to get into space first, who's going to land on the moon first. John F. Kennedy makes a very bold statement, kind of in 1959, 1960, whenever it was, um, that by the end of the decade, by the next 10 years, that they would put a man on the moon. This had not been done, at least from our understanding, in all of human history. And you know, why putting a person on the moon is so important is kind of beyond me. But anyways, they have this space race over the next 10 years. There's a lot of technological advancements brought to society for that. I believe the microwave was invented as part of the space race as well. So you know, for all of you who use microwaves, I use microwaves plenty. I'm very grateful for that. So in 1969, U.S. astronauts Neil Armstrong, Edwin Buzz Aldrin, and Michael Collins make it to the moon. Armstrong is the first man to walk on the moon, and is followed by Buzz Aldrin. I love how no one talks about the third guy. Like I've never really heard his name before. Um, who's the next person who's going to go? Okay. To the library for your testing. Okay. There is a photo of, I believe, that is Neil Armstrong there. Um, to pass up. I, I believe so. It could be... <laughs> no, not, not, not our deal. Not our deal. <laughs> it's interesting. Some people think this moon landing was fake. It looks, it looks fake. Why does it look fake? Why would they think it's fake, though? Yeah. Well, I don't know, man. People like yeah. believing yeah. stuff. Like, none of the rocks look like Donald Trump, apparently. So that... <laughs> Do you, you think it was fake? You think this, you think it looked fake? It looks Photoshop. You look, it looks Photoshop. Photoshop wasn't even invented back then. Uh, uh, I don't know what I would assume he's saluting, yeah. He's standing behind. Not that kind of salute. Uh, sir. <laughs> <Standing> behind. <laughs> <laughs> Although, you know, NASA was founded by a Nazi. Yeah. Oh, yes. I didn't know that. I said that yesterday. Uh, Adam ruins everything to prove, prove that, uh, that uh, the uh, moon landing is real and it's hard to fake it, though. So, who, who did this? <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I don't know. I'm just bringing it up. It's just interesting. Some people think it was fake. There's no way it's real. I know for certain that I haven't been to the moon, so I can't tell you for sure. Uh, another term, espionage. I think I went over this in my grade nines. Um, espionage is spying. So he's just a fun class, eh? Uh, there's a lot of spying that went on during the Cold War. You know, they're always trying to gain intel and gain secrets. A lot of movies based around that. Um, obviously, anyone seen the uh, the Bourne series, Jason Bourne series? 
Yeah, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, just cut it out, man. You're not editing this, man. Nobody pays me. It ain't hard, man. You gotta, you, to you, you gotta teach me. This guy made a legendary video. It's almost at 500 views. Yeah, you, you know, you got like 10 views, boy. You know what I'm talking about? Okay, Deep out, I was right. Me, uh, so there's three main spy agencies: the CIA, which is USA, KGB, and the MI MI5. Um, nuclear arms race was another competition of the Cold War to see who could develop the most and the biggest nuclear weapons for you know horrible reasons. Yeah. Okay. Oh, we're back to deterrence. So again, remember how I said yesterday how I need to. Fix my notes. Okay. I'm not even sure what this graph is. <laughs> Here, here's a fun little graph though. So here's Hiroshima down low. And the biggest kind of nuclear style weapon that they made was the Tsar Bamba. Original design was 100 megatons, but was scaled down to 50 megatons to reduce the resulting nuclear fallout. So the Soviets were, you know, at some point were like, damn, this bomb might negatively affect ourselves for testing it. But as you can see, the bomb they dropped on Hiroshima was about 15 kilotons. You know, this, this thing is megatons. I have made that one. You know, so, so there's kind of two aspects to this. One was like, let's just develop a giant bomb and we'll fly a plane to drop it. But then once they had rocket technology that could go through space, it's like, okay, how do we make them smaller and faster? Shoot them up through space, it goes in through space, there's no air resistance, and then it just gets to where it goes. You know? So there's kind of this, uh, there's kind of a balance between just having a giant bomb that kills everyone within, you know, a giant distance, as you can see, like that thing is ridiculous. Like Hiroshima wiped out a city. Okay, like this, this, this might be able to wipe out like part of Europe. Um, not, I don't even know where they dropped that bomb, but probably somewhere in Siberia. They dropped it on the Atlantis. <laughs> um, that's like, uh, we already talked about non-alignment. We already talked about containment, again, containing people and their ideologies into small areas, right? Like the last thing that the, the, the United States policies, the last thing that the West wanted to see was communism grow. Um, you know, particularly in the 20th, in the 21st century, which would be the 1900s, communism was incredibly parasitic. Even now, you know, people say like, oh, look at China, like it's prospering. But that's because, you know, China took on a lot of capitalist policies. For example, so many things are made in China. You know, they're engaging in international trade, which isn't not very, not very communist of them. Uh, there's a lot of human rights violations in China. I remember when I was in high school, they would talk about, you know, these Chinese factories with workers. They put, they would put, uh, they would bar the windows shut so people couldn't jump out and kill themselves because the working conditions were so horrible. So, um, you know, and there's no democracy in China. There's no real, there, there, there's a state media, so they tell whatever they want to tell. There's no real, I mean, anybody see any videos that came out of China during COVID? Like some of them are real harrowing. Like I remember seeing this one where <clears throat> this particular city and this building was being locked down because there was a positive COVID case. And this person was recording in the lobby of this building and the lobby of the building is like the size of the school. And all you see is people just fleeing like in mass out the door before the authorities come in and bar shut people's like they just shut them into the to the building and like well you're stuck here for two weeks while you isolate uh my friend whose brother lives my friend he's chinese and his brother lives in china i mean this guy was literally boarded shut into his room during one of the covid lockdowns like he couldn't leave his room and he lives by himself so and you know why that's relevant is because even at the United Nations level, they understand that the worst thing you could do to a person who's in prison is to isolate them, put them in solitary confinement. It's actually inhumane to put someone, I think it's about seven or 14 days, they say anything beyond that, it's inhumane treatment, right? Because of the negative consequences that come from you know, isolating a person for that long. And you know, obviously when you're in a 
you know, in these communist states, like they don't care, right? The government tells you what is best and you have to do it regardless of what your circumstances are. Uh, we already chat about proxy wars in general, but one of them was Vietnam. <clears throat> Okay, so a lot of these things do start with independence movements. For whatever reason, you know, communists rise up because of, you know, whatever reasons. Um, they see oppressors in society and they potentially are jealous of other people's success. You know, they want to create some sort of utopia. They make the claim that, well, the Russians, the Chinese, they did it wrong. We'll do it right. Which, you know, as you can see, these dominoes falling over. The worry is that, as Eisenhower is saying, is that the worry is that as soon as these countries start to fall to communism, that more and more of them will. So how do you prevent that? Okay, the USA sent 500,000 soldiers over to ensure that South Vietnam stayed capitalist. They partook in guerrilla warfare, which is so organized well, guerrilla warfare is unorganized. There's no real pattern or strategy. A lot of it is just a war of attrition. You're just trying to hurt the enemy, damage them as much as you can. Um, you know, obviously the, the memes of the Vietnam War are very funny despite how horrific that war was. Um, the USA lost 58,000 soldiers, over 1 million Vietnamese civilians died. So there's a lot of, it was just a really horrific conflict. Uh, there's a lot of anti-war movements. Muhammad Ali lost a few years off of his prime in his career. Muhammad Ali was a boxer, for those of you who don't know, uh, because he uh, protested against the war. You know, he famously said that while well, no, you know, no Viet Cong person had called him the N-word, why is he supposed to go over there and fight them and kill them? You know, the trouble he faces in his life happens in America, where people are racist, they mistreat him and abuse him is very fair and you know he took a few years off from his career for that um, just skip over this uh, the Afghanistan war as well very similar so there is a variety of coups there's overthrowing the government you know Afghanistan goes between if I recall correctly they had a they had a royal government, so there was a king. Uh, I believe he was overthrown at some point. There was a democratic government, there was a communist government, and they're constantly just going back and forth. Eventually, at one point, the communist government is overthrown, and the Russians decide to step in to you know, put in place their guy, whoever they want, to support their ideals, which leads to a conflict between the Afghani people and the Russian uh, Soviet army. And, America steps in, Pakistan steps in, a lot of the Islamic world steps in to financially fund the Afghanis, uh, you know, the Mujahideen, the freedom fighters, who are trying to get rid of this occupation from Western influence. And the Russians lost that war horribly. Obviously, you know, the help from the Americans, the military weapons and whatnot that they got was quite helpful. Uh, and as I mentioned, this is described as the USSR's Vietnam. Right, this war that they should have gone in and just cleaned house, they lost horribly, lost hundreds of, I mean, in the, in the lecture I have for that, we'll, we'll look at that more closely. Okay. Uh, here's a couple photos. So you, know, you have members of the Mujahideen, some of these freedom fighters. I believe this is in the White House. They're meeting with uh, Ronald Reagan, if I recall correctly, yeah. Is that rumbling outside? So like a plane going by, or is that? Can you go back one side, yo? What? Um, so, one of the things with the Russian invasion of Afghanistan is that, in the back of their minds, they knew that they would never be supported by the Afghani people. The Americans also tried to set up democracy and freedom there, and they weren't supported as well. And um, there's actually a really good podcast with two rappers of all people, Immortal Technique and Lupe Fiasco, and they talk about what the life is like for Afghani people now, the enmity they still hold for you know, Russians, Americans, but particularly Saudis as well. <laughs> because 
the Saudis showed up to fight for you know holy war jihad and uh, they never left many of them you know and they maintained some of those terror groups terrorist organizations as well um, <clears throat> What do I want to say about this? Uh, detente then becomes a process of reducing tensions and managing the conflict. You know, nobody likes being in a tense state all the time. No one wants to be in, in a state of conflict all the time. Um, and obviously, conflict can often get in the way of uh, economic progress, which is what most countries are looking for. Everybody likes making money. Nobody likes dying, really. Okay. Uh, there's a couple of treaties, but we don't really need to go into that. Okay, eventually, you know, the, the Soviets start to change. Uh, obviously, at the bottom there, December 30th, 1991, the Soviet Union was officially dissolved, but you know, they've re reformed the Soviet economy, they reformed the political structures, Becomes, uh, from my understanding, becomes a little bit more democratic, a little bit more capitalist. Uh, obviously, there are still problems in the Russian society, and still to this, to this day, um, with uh, what do they call it? like oligarchs. So there's a lot of crime. There's a lot of you know. Obviously, there's not any democratic elections in Russia to this day. They're still a quasi-communist. They're not necessarily capitalists in the Western. Although I wouldn't say they're quite communist. I, I don't know too much about that. But they're definitely not democratic. Like Vladimir Putin wasn't really elected by the people. A lot of the political individuals who who were running against him or trying to speak against him, a lot of them get put into jail. A lot of them disappear under mysterious circumstances. A lot of reporters are in prison. You know, it's not a free country, that's for sure. We already talked about the wall comes down. Um, is that the last slide that is? Okay, well, that's that.